All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for joining Orvis's first 2022 campfire session. I will be your host this afternoon. I'm Keelan, guiding our discussion along on recreation diversification. Uh, for those of you new here today, a quick background on Orbis Incorporated. Orbis is a technology company based in Charlotte, North Carolina, specializing in assisting the natural resource industry in multiple areas, including GIS, recreation management, data management, diligence support, property tax management, and so much more. If you're interested in reading any, a little bit more about Orbis, you can always visit our website orbitsinc.com or check out our LinkedIn page. Now, before we get into today's discussion, we do have a few housekeeping items uh, as usual. And some of those discussions of our, some of those housekeeping items are number one, we are going to have a QA and a session uh, during our call today. And you guys can ask questions at any time. Uh, just submit those at the bottom of your screen, bottom right hand. It says, ask a question. Um, and we just ask as you send those questions in, if you could please direct who you would like the question to go to. And just a reminder, you can submit those at any time throughout today's discussion. Secondly, we are going to have a poll in our uh, session today, but you can actually answer that poll at any time throughout today's session as well. That's right beside the same area where it says ask a question, it says polls. So go ahead and answer those polls at any time throughout today's session, and we'll look back at those results here later on in our uh, session. Now, lastly, as you guys know, Orbis, we love a good giveaway. We would not miss an opportunity, so today's session as well. If you are logged in uh, to our campfire session, you are automatically entered into the drawing. And we will do that after uh, our session, and we will reach out directly to the winner um, from there. Okay. Looks like I've not missed anything from my housekeeping item list, so let's get started. As I mentioned, we are going to be looking at uh, diversification in recreational land leasing. Orbis has been working in the, the recreation area now for over 15 years, and our clients, much of you uh, like joining us here today, are managing their hundreds or, or some of the millions of acres of land. And what we're seeing in the market is that there is now uh, a change, and people are looking for how can we continue to diversify our recreational offerings to the public. And so joining me today are three esteemed plan panelists and experts in this area who will be assisting us in uh, providing a bit more information for our insight. Okay, first up, we have Jason Burke. Jason Burke is the National Manager of Recreational Licenses and Permits at Manu Life Investment Management. So welcome, Jason. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Hey, Ani, I want to thank Orbis for having me today. All right, thank you. We're excited. All right, next up, uh, joining us today is Brad Krebs. Brad Krebs is the director of the Clinch Valley Program in Virginia for the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Brad, for being here as well. Glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Uh, lastly, uh, today's call, we're also going to have Grant Steigers. Grant is the land use forester at Pop Next Delta out in uh, Washington. Thank you so much for being here, Grant. Thank you. Nice to be here. Wonderful. Okay, that wraps up our speaker introductions. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. And Grant, while we have you up on the screen, why don't we just kick off today's call with you? Okay. Um, and if you don't mind, uh, for myself and for everyone joining us today, we'd like to just start with you giving us a background on what you do for college topic. Well, I started many years ago in the GIS end of the business for the uh, Timberlands division and worked 
in various roles um, for a number of years. About 10 years ago, I took the position of land use forester, and I described that as, as doing all of the non-forestry related items um, to timberland ownership. So that's grazing, the recreation program, mining and minerals, uh, survey administration. So that's how I ended up here. Perfect. Um, so, you know, historically, how would you say the recreation land in the areas you manage has been utilized? So in the past, um, recreation was really unmanaged um, in Idaho. Um, the, the public, the recreation public tends to think of industrial timberland as just being public land and um, it's taken some time to try and get the message out that, hey, this is actually private land and it's a privilege, not a right to be able to recreate on this property. So about 15 years ago, we implemented uh, our recreation program and started selling permits to the public for camping, motorized access, non-motorized access, um, ATV use, and also started um, a security um, program where we hired some outside consultants to provide um, security patrols. And we've evolved that program over years. Um, we've also gotten into an agreement with the state of Idaho to provide hunting access to our land. And um, what the benefits we see is not strictly financial because um, the, the, the income from these permits um, help offset the, the costs for security, but, but the, the benefits we see are allowing us to have uh, better contact information to the recreation public and to be able to get the word out on things like closures or fire restrictions. Um, also, if we're having uh, any type of um, harvest or silvicultural activities, if, if we know who's camped in a particular spot, we can send them an email or call them and say, hey, we need you to move um, because we're going to do some sort of activity there. So it, it's uh, having that um, connection to the public or being able to contact them is, is one of the big benefits that we're seeing. And, and also we're, we're seeing a, um, a relationship with our, our real estate program where we have somebody camping on our, our ownership and, and they say, hey, we would like to, to buy this land. And, and we say, well, maybe not this particular piece of property, but we have some for sale just down the road. And so that having that relationship with our real estate program is a big benefit as well. Oh, that's awesome. And you talked about how you've seen um, the permit program and the campus program evolve. Can you comment or on some of those changes that you've seen in the last 15 years or um, kind of how the program has grown a little bit more specifically? Sure. sure. So one example is our, our camping program. And in, in the past, uh, we would sell a, a year-long camping permit that would allow people to just camp wherever they wanted. And in the springtime, um, when that permit became active, it kind of became uh, a rush to get to their preferred campsites because it was a first come first serve basis. And, and so people were dragging their camp trailers through the snow just to secure their favorite spot. And, and what we've now done is, um, decided to have designated sites that they can lease and Orbis handles the leasing for that and it has worked out quite well so that they don't have to rush out there to get their preferred spot it's it's their spot for the year and um, so they they seem quite happy with that option oh that's great awesome Thanks. all right um, well 
last question for you, Brant. Uh, you know, we have viewers coming in from both the West Coast and from the East Coast, Midwest, all over the country. Uh, can you give us any insight on kind of differences that you see between West Coast recreation versus East Coast? Or do you feel like sure. they're totally the same? Well, there there is some differences. Um, as I said in the past, um, because of the intermingled ownership here in the West, um, people have tended to treat industrial timberland like public land, and they've just figured it was open to all use. And and so that's taken some time to try and educate them that, hey, this is private land, you need to treat it special, or, or you may lose that, lose that privilege. Um, and and I don't know if it's just tradition or um, the the density of big game animals or just the type of hunting that takes place, but but leasing land strictly to a an exclusive lease just to a hunt club hasn't really caught on out here, and so we have um, went down the path of of leasing campsites um, to recreationalists that use them in the summer, but um, those are very small percentages of our ownership. These campsites are maybe one to two acres in size, and that allows the rest of the ownership to still be open for, for public access for hunting. Um, we do have a little video that we use to help promote these campsites, and uh, you, you might be able to pull that up and just show an example of, of what these small campsites look like. Perfect. Here we go. So that's um, along the Palouse River in north central Idaho and is one of the more popular sites for, for recreational camping. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Fran, for providing that insight. We will check back in with you here just in a little bit. But for now, we're going to move on over and, and have a quick discussion with Brad. Thank you, Fran. Thank you. All right, Brad, thanks so much for being here as well. Um, as I mentioned, everyone, you are the Clint Valley Program Director uh, in Virginia with the Anchor Conservancy. Can you provide any more insight for our viewers about what you're doing with that program? Sure, glad to. So uh, the Nature Conservancy, if, if you've not heard of us, we're a nonprofit conservation organization, one of the largest in the world. Um, and we have offices and chapters in all 50 states across the U.S. and, and many other countries as well. Um, I am based in southwestern Virginia near the Tennessee-Virginia border. And um, there we have a really uh, innovative project called the Cumberland Forest Project, which covers a quarter million acres of land that we manage um, for the Cumberland Forest Limited Partnership. So the Nature Conservancy doesn't own the land but we are a managing partner in a limited partnership that, that controls the land. Um, so it's a very large property in the Coalfields region of Virginia and, and Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, and so historically the, the properties were coal properties, um, but uh, we are managing those large areas primarily for forest conservation, um, but we also have an extensive amount of, uh, you know, recreational programs, and we're trying to demonstrate that we can manage those quarter million acres in ways that are not just good for nature and wildlife, but also good for local people. Um, and so the, the the recreation component to our management is is a really important piece, along with our forestry work and, and other wildlife management work. 
Yeah, wonderful. I mean, can you provide any sort of insight more specifically on what's happening in the conservation landscape as it kind of relates to recreational leasing? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, for the for the Nature Conservancy and, and other groups, um, you know, we're thinking at bigger and bigger scales around our conservation vision. So, you know, for example, the, the Cumberland Forest Project is part of a much bigger um, effort we have underway in the Appalachian Mountains from Alabama to, to Canada to try to conserve connected forests across that entire mountain region. And so while um, the Nature Conservancy has for a long time acquired properties for nature pr preserves um, uh, in smaller acreages, you know, we're now really pushing ourselves to go bigger um, with larger properties. And so as you start to acquire and manage larger properties um, it, and you want to make sure that your, your work is benefiting people in addition to nature, um, you know, we're beginning to look at a lot of multi-use strategies on these much larger properties. And so recreational leasing, leasing for agricultural uses, um, you know, other types of, of activities that involve connecting people to the properties is, I think, a growing trend, something you'll see more and more in the conservation world. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, for our viewers today, can you provide us any sort of tips on how we can practice uh, more responsible use of our recreational lands? Sure. And, you know, even more specifically, if you have any thoughts on ESG, one of the big hot topics, one of our recent campfire sessions we're focused on, and kind of what organizations should be keeping in mind as they look to diversify their, their land use. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, well, I'll just come up with a few examples for, from you know from our Cumberland Forest Project. Um, so we have an extensive private hunt leasing program with a number of clubs. Um, we, we actually work with Orbis to manage that program and that, that's gone really well. Um, you know, there we have private clubs that are annually leasing, leasing sections of the property, mostly for hunting. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we really focus on is maintaining sustainable wildlife populations and appropriate, uh, you know, for example, deer, you know, not having uh, too many or too few deer. And so we encourage the clubs as much as possible to enroll in programs with the state wildlife agencies that collect information on the deer they harvest every year in terms of their size, sex ratio, et cetera. So we, we can sort of have an understanding of our overall population and, and trying to get that at a, at a sustainable level. So, um, you know, I think that would be, you know, one tip for, from a hunting perspective. Um, you, we also have other types of recreation on the property um, both motorized and non-motorized trails. Um, and the motorized trails are a new thing for us. Um, and we've had to learn a lot about how that works. And th there are, you know, more environmental risks um, with, with motorized recreation, erosion and sedimentation and things like that. So we've had to learn a lot there, but we've been working with those trails. Many of those we inherited when we bought the property, but We've been working on changes to those trail systems that we think are going to, over time, make them more sustainable and, and less likely to cause problems like a sedimentation or erosion. So I think that's something to be mindful of um, if, if you're into um, sort of motorized use, which is you know, very popular, um, but I think it, it requires you know, a different approach than non-motorized. So that, that's a couple of examples with, with the hunting and the motorized that I might point out. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much. All great points. Uh, thank you so much, Brad, uh, for your insight. Again, we will come back to talk with you a little bit here um, in just in a bit as well. Uh, before we move on to our next panelist, I want to just give a quick reminder to everyone, uh, please submit your questions and direct those questions to who you'd like those to go to. Uh, in addition, uh, please go ahead and answer those poll questions on the bottom of your screen anytime throughout our discussion as we'll be um, referring back to those and looking at what our poll is uh, telling us. 
So with that being said, we're going to move on to our uh, panelist, Jason Burke. You are up in the hot seat now, if you will. Uh, thank you so much, Jason, for being here. And like the others, would you mind giving everyone on this call a quick introduction on exactly what it is you're doing for Man Life? Sure. Thanks, Ani. Um, my, uh, my primarily my primary responsibility at Manulife is um, is to oversee our recreational access and permit program. Um, it's on approximately 3.6 million acres of timberlands in North America, as, as well as about 300 to 400,000 acres of farmlands um, throughout the Delta region along the Mississippi River and up in the Midwest of, of uh, North America. Um, uh, since we are a for-profit company uh, related to our fiduciary responsibilities. Um, I have additional duties that where I lead a team, a recreation team to evaluate um, recreational value on a lot of these client lands throughout North America. Um, and we look at these properties both at a regional and local scale um, to help determine uh, if we are maximizing the available opportunities that may present themselves on those properties. Um, and one last point, just related to my wildlife biologist background, um, I am also involved in many of our value-added services projects uh, with the company uh, related to habitat stewardship, uh, mitigation, um, agency partnerships, uh, and can even work on some carbon banking sequestration type projects as well. Well, that's perfect. And do you see a big crossover from, you know, the value-add areas that you're working on and in recreation? Do you see any alignment there? Yeah, so that's that's... Similar, my role it kind of overlaps in that regard. Value add services as well as um, uh, the recreation. See how those line up, and, and a lot of those are very congruent and overlap well together. And some not so much. Of course. <laughs> um, so you know, kind of mounting off of what you do, can you provide us uh, an introduction on how Man Life defines recreation uh, diversification? for as a company? How do you guys really position yourselves to say that you are diversifying your recreation portfolio, if you will? Sure. Um, well, much like Brad talked about with the Nature Conservancy, uh, we are uh, have a focus on multiple use opportunities. And uh, from our client responsibilities revenue-wise, we want to diversify our revenue sources as well. Um, so it's in our best interest to to look for uh, additional revenue sources to maximize, you know, our, our profits for our clients that we're managing these properties for. Um, and we truly believe, you know, good stewardship is good business. And, you know, we try to focus on determining um, a recreational value for a particular property and then uh, evaluate how that activity can be overlapped with some of our um, some of our primary land business operations such as forestry and farming and how those will conflict or, or work together or if they can work together and we have to ask the question does it fit some of our primary land businesses um, you know related to land stewardship uh, our sustainability commitments as a corporation um, and how about how does that activity that recreation activity align with our company ESG program and plan now, how how is the public going to perceive some of these things that we're doing, um, or or wanting to open up to the public for recreation? Um, so we know as a team that there's a diverse appetite for a variety of land recreation uses out there, um, but we do have to evaluate how they fit into our stewardship ESG plans, and ultimately determine uh, if we will pursue those ventures or not. But uh, we we do understand that the diverse set of uh, recreational value on our client properties is there. Um, and uh, we know that, you know, providing that opportunity to the public can not only enhance company uh, profits and revenues, but also provide an important need to society for, for people to be able to recreate and get out onto, you know, out onto land and, and do the recreation activity, their choice. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, there there have been regional and generational shifts uh, over time uh, related to consumptive type recreation, 
like hunting and fishing, um, which I think we're seeing a little change in that now, uh, which could likely trend towards less consumptive recreational types, such as photography or bike riding, bird watching, things like that. So, you know, we're trying to monitor those trends where, where some of these uh, activities are going, you know, away from the traditional hunting and, and fishing and, um, and, and try to provide opportunities for the public to have a diverse set of uh, opportunities for the public. Fantastic. Wow, you guys are really focused on diversifying and looking forward to the future, it seems. Uh, for sure. You know, you talked about how you're, you know, monitoring those changes. Can you give any more insight on, on what you guys are doing to monitor those changes? Are you, you know, polling your users or how are you guys looking at those? Yeah, I mean, we just have, we have a lot of research we look at and, and you know, we do do poll the hunting clubs and poll uh, some of our other recreational uh, users and put some of that data together. Um, and some of it's just time in the industry. We have a lot of guys and girls that are in the industry uh, that are on our team that understand the trends and where we're going. And we try to set up our team uh, to provide additional opportunities for things we may not think of. Um, uh, you know, by having a diverse team, we can, we can have diverse ideas to go in different directions. Uh, and, and you, you know, as you speak about trends and recreational lands, do you see any obstacles that you're having to look out for with these specifically? Yes, I, I have a couple that came to mind. Um, number one, uh, I, I alluded to this earlier, the, a generational shift, um, age class trends, you know, most of our hunters, particularly in the southern region and along the east coast, are 60 plus years old. Um, and to be quite honest, they struggle with uh, using apps and internet and paying online and finding licenses. And um, it, it's, it's very evident because most of the new customers that we get are, are younger. And so we're not getting those, those older customers and, um, you know, those older customers are the ones that are retired. They are the ones that have the 401ks, the discretionary income to spend on recreational activities. So you, if you, you know, our question is always, how do we reach the, you know, the older, older customers to, to provide them that opportunity? Because most of those are the ones that make up the hunting clubs in the South, which is the primary recreation activity in the Southern region. Um, you know, we've had a recent spike in hunting and outdoor rec. Uh, with the pandemic over the last two years, um, a lot of new people coming to recreation in, in, in the outdoors and a lot of um, just a lot of new people. But also, you know, there's been a recent uh, huge push, I think, with the uh, NWTF and some of the other nonprofit agencies that are to open up more private lands to public rec use across the country um, as demand starting to increase. But um, let's see, another trend that I kind of uh, see coming is, you know, land size is not getting any bigger. Tracks are getting smaller. The shrinking private ownership uh, of properties is getting, getting smaller and it's harder to find access to some of these properties. And uh, that's going to be a major concern going forward. As these properties get smaller, access concerns would be an issue. And then uh, the last trend kind of comes to mind is technology. Um, you know, need for everybody's on social media and, and apps now. And so the need for companies and, and land uh, companies that provide opp opportunities for access to land, you know, are going to need uh, to, to create apps and have a very customer service oriented focus to addressing the, the millions of people that are going to be looking for properties uh, much and you can operate much like an Airbnb type app to provide a multitude or diversity of recreational activities for to help uh, the public find these opportunities. So um, traditional websites aren't really doing that now, in my opinion, because most people are mobile and, and using apps and doing these. But uh, it's just a it's a, a lot of things changing over the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jason. You're really giving us. 
uh, another great insight on to recreation from a profit company and from a very large scale. And as you look into the future, we appreciate that. And again, guys, just another reminder for everyone on today's call, if you have questions for Jason, if you have questions for Brad or Brant, please be sure to go ahead and ask those questions as we'll be getting, uh, coming back to those questions here in just a little bit. So, Jason, thank you so much again. Um, everyone, I will now direct you to look at your polls, question, polls in the bottom of your uh, screen. We'll look at what everyone is saying. Our first poll question that we had up today was, if you own or manage recreational land, what is the main activity is it currently being used for? Looks like that we're uh, most are still in hunting, that we have some pre-crop production camping, uh, you know, Brant, what would you say most of your property is being used for currently? Uh, hunting and summer recreation would be the two biggest ones. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, you know, Brad, what about you guys? Um, I'd say hunting, wildlife, watching, um, and uh, trails. Wildlife watching. Oh, that's a good one. And everybody loves a good hike out on the trails. Uh, Jason, any come period for us? Uh, depends on the region. Southern region, uh, definitely hunting clubs. Uh, Northwest region, access permits uh, to large blocks for hiking, berry picking, some elk hunting, mule deer, and then up in the north, in the north, uh, we have snowmobiles and cabins that, that are getting a lot of access. So. Awesome. Okay, our second poll question was, what potential risk concerns you, you see the most about diversifying land use? Uh, looks like the majority with 67% almost said liability. Uh, you know, Brad, do you feel like you guys have, um, any liability issues on y'all's property? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we want to make sure like with our private leasing program that we have, you know, insurance provisions and coverage for uses that, you know, give us comfort there. Um, we also have some agreements on public access with um, public agencies that provide some blanket liability uh, protections for us as a landowner, you know, voluntarily participating in public programs. But, but certainly that's an issue that we have to uh, have to think about and have to manage for. Sure. Um, Brant, as you said, you guys are kind of changing the process from uh, people camping on the properties now that they have their specific areas where we see one of those is Mis potential misuse of property. Do you see, you know, any changes in that liability? Maybe a, a decrease um, in the risk there now that you have specific individuals who are uh, licensed in the camping area? Or what have you seen? Well, as an example, um, we have banned campfires on our property with the exception of these people that have the campsite leases. Um, because if a wildfire escapes from a, a campfire, we'll be able to trace it right back to these campsites and know who started it. And, and so that's, that's why we allow it on these lease campsites, because we know who would have started the fire. But otherwise, campfires are not allowed during the summer on our ownership. Yeah. And do you have any other, what's one of the biggest liabilities for the recreational land that you're managing? Would you say? Well, another example of trying to manage that liability is that we've stopped um, issuing firewood permits. Um, two years ago, we had a firewood cutter start our the largest fire on our Idaho ownership, just due to a chainsaw that had hot exhaust that started a fire. So we've we've eliminated the the firewood gathering permit just to try and reduce the, the liability issue there. Yeah, definitely. Jason, Brad, do you feel like your property is going to have less liability um, in regards to wildfires and grant? It seems like a very big issue for grant. How do you guys um, have to deal with that? Or what do you see more as kind of the biggest liability on your properties? Jason, we can start with you, for example. 
Yeah, so um, in the Northwest, you know, we have issues with fire as well. Um, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of acres of block, large blocks that we have permits uh, that we've sold. And with the wildfire season we had this past year and previous years, um, you know, sometimes we have to close it down and we get a lot of public backlash on selling permits. Um, but uh, we've gone out of our way to, to uh, post maps of closures and gate closures and, and access areas and uh, mass communication, whether it's social media or um, by mass email. Um, we can't call thousands of people in, you know, over a day, but we can put it out there so um, to, to help keep, um, help people be aware of what's going on in the Northwest related to wildfire liability. Um, in the Southern region, we kind of restrict our camps to uh, keep our campfires in barrels or small campsites. And uh, if we see a, a campsite where it may be too large, it may be some, um, some liability there, you know, we'll, we'll notify clubs to, to remove it or, or use a different way. Great. Brad, do you see any other types of really high risk liability um, on maintenance services properties? And of course, that's, big, that's a big span across the entire 50 states, but let's focus on the Virginia area. Sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have the wildfire risk that we, you know, you're hearing about from the West, um, but we are still pretty restrictive, um, similar to what Brant was saying um, on, on campfires. It requires permission or you don't get permission unless you ask for it and it has to be very contained and focused, just similar to what Brant's saying. So we know exactly who, who we're providing permission to in case there's a problem um, and, and understanding the source. Um, uh, and of course, making sure that if there are fire bans or warnings that, you know, there's good communication on all of those things. I mean, that's a really important issue, even in the southeast, too. Um, you know, the, the motorized trails, you know, that uh, is an activity where, you know, there's layers of, of protection around that from a permit system um, to, you know, a quasi state agency that is charged with managing that trail system and has insurance provisions and then state provisions for indemnification. So, um, you know, that would be another one that maybe I would think about it, it to mention. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, guys. I mean, I could sit here all day and ask you a million questions, but we'll get back to the Q&A session in just a bit. First, we have to have our fire starter rounds. Uh, because we do love a good game, and this has really become a staple of campfire sessions as we're talking about fires and campfires. Let's continue on. And just a reminder, guys, before we do start this fire round session for everyone joining us, please don't forget to submit those questions during this session, during this campfire round, fire starter round. This will be your last opportunity to ask questions to our esteemed panelists, and we just ask that you direct who you would like that question to go to. So for those of you new here joining us, Orbis has an awesome game, which we call a fire starter round. And this is what we're focused on, looking into our topic of discussion on uh, different topics within that. And we're going to ask our panelists if these subjects or these topics are hot or not in the industry. So all of our panelists have a, um, a sign that we have provided them. On one side, it has a flame. So if anyone can hold up their flame for us on the screen now, um, I will say a topic. And if the panelists holds up a flame, that means that they think the topic is really hot in the industry right now. It's something that we should be paying attention to. Now, if they disagree and think that it's just not there anymore, it's not anything that we really need to be paying so much attention to, it's not gonna start a fire or anything like that, if you will, they'll hold up another sign which has an extinguished flame with a big old red arrow. If anyone could just hold up that sign for me. You guys are turning into Vanna White now. This sign just means that they do not agree with it being a relevant topic in our industry. And this is meant to be quick. So you guys, I hope you're ready with your arms who've been doing your workouts, ready to throw the signs up in the air. Uh, any questions from our panelists? 
Okay, good. I'm not going to give you much time. No, it's good. All right. We are going to start with a few topics, and our panelists have not seen this list. So this is going to be very good. Okay, here we go. First word is public access. Is it hot or not? Everyone's in agreement here. Public access is hot. Baiting laws. Baiting laws, deer association, pushing with clients. It's not. Okay. Don't worry about those baiting laws, everyone. How about SFI certification? Should our end users be worrying about SIS certification in comparison to recognition? <laughs> okay, our conservation man says, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have to take a minute here, Brad, and we have to ask you, you're our only one who said it's important right now, or it's a very hot topic. Why would you say that SFI, SFI no. certification is a hot topic? Well, the reason I held up both was that there's different forest certification programs. So there's different feelings about different programs. There's SFI, FSC, FSC and others. So uh, um, I, I would think from a conservation standpoint, though, uh, all of our forests are um, FSC certified, um, which is just a different program. Um, and yeah, we, we like the concept of third party certification for good forest stewardship. So that's why. It's mostly hot for me, but I just didn't want to play favorites. There's a few different programs. I love it. All right, all right. Okay, let's get through a couple more, guys. How about free access? So no money. Um, I think we know what Jason's going to put up here. What? What? This is surprising you. No, I'm just kidding. Free access. Everybody's loving free access. This is a hot topic. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, guys, how about hiking trails? Hitting with a backpack. Not. What? Brad, hiking trails. Okay. Oh, hiking trails. How about this? One of my favorites, not just camping, but glamping. <laughs> not. Thank you, Brad. I like glamping. Come on. We can live, we can camp in luxury, right? Motorized access. Hot topic. Everyone wants to bring out their ATV and hit the trails. Okay. Oh, well, speaking of that, ATV riding, ATV or ORV riding, hot, hot, even bad stuff is hot. Okay. Day or week leases. Day or week leases versus an annual lease. Not from Brad, not, 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 not hot yet. Where are we headed? Who knows? Only time will tell. How about wildlife habitats? Brad says it's hot. Okay, this is brand new. We've got to come to you. You're the only one because it's not really a hot topic. Why do you feel like this is? Not anything to be. It, I guess it would be for some people, but uh, we are a for-profit company, so uh, we're in the business of growing trees, and and the wildlife will be there if if we do our job. The, the wildlife will be there. So. Fair enough. Okay, guys, we've got one more. Ready for it? And this is a big one, not just in our industry, but the entire country right now. Inflation and the effect on our hunting rates. Hot, hot, hot. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a hard one. Jason, do you feel like you've seen an increase in the number of phone calls that you're receiving or anything that you had to deal with or had you guys adjusted rates to inflation for many lives? I think it's too early yet. Um, we're in the middle of renewals right now for a lot of our hunting licenses, but I think in about another six months, we might really be changing our tune on a lot of these things. Because like I talked about, discretionary money for recreational activities is, is going to change in the next six to 12 months for a lot of people. All right, perfect. Well, thank you. Okay, guys, we are moving along now to our uh, Q&A session. This is our last uh, 
session within our campfire session. I'm using the word session a lot. Okay, but our first question is going to Brant. We have received a question that says, the recreational opportunities provided by the panelists impact the economy of these rural communities. Brant, do you see local towns adding amenities like shops, restaurants, gas, bait, ice to support your current participants and their activities? Uh, yes, we we do see that. It's it's hard to quantify what our recreational program, what the impact is on local communities and economy, but but it definitely does have an impact. So we see. Um, the hunting outfitters are are doing well around here. We see a lot of um, out of state hunters come into the area, and so when they stay, they're going to be um, spending a lot of money at local hotels and restaurants. Um, and and also local communities are benefiting from our our public access policy. There's a small community um, called Elk River that holds a ATV fun run um, every year to raise money for their fireworks show. And in the past, they've gotten about 800 participants bringing their UTVs or ATVs on, on this fun run. So that generates a lot of money for that small community. So, so yeah, it, it, it is a big benefit to small communities around here. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, next question is actually for Brad and Grant. Uh, we'll start with Brad. Jason mentioned the age of his customers. Can you, and we'll start again with Brad, comment on the ages and makeups of your clients in, uh, in your area for recreation? Um, yeah, I, I think that we don't have great data on this, but um, I would say that generally what Jason was saying about the hunting community shifting towards an older demographic, uh, anecdotally, we've seen that, although hunting is still something quite popular in the, you know, Southern mountains. So I think there's still a pretty good spread there. The other kinds of recreation are much more, you know, you know across sector. So the, the motorized trails, the hiking trails, um, you know, the mountain biking tends to be a younger age set. Um, so, uh, kind of anecdotally, that's what we see. Any differences, or do you feel like it's kind of the same as, as Brad and, and Jason have been mentioning in regards to your, your users and their age or makeup of your clients? Was this for me? Yeah, for your users. Do you feel okay. like? Uh, kind of in the same, are they about the same age group? Are you guys collecting? Do you guys have that kind of data regarding? No, we we don't have age demographics um, for our our users, but um, just from talking to them, it, it tends to be a multi generational thing. Um, these older retired people go out and and have their campsite leases, and they bring their grandkids along, and so that just perpetuates this into the future. And, and we hear lots of stories of people that have been camping at the same spot for 30 or 40 years, and, and they have fond memories of, of recreating on Potlatch Deltic land. And, and so I think it will continue in the future with this. Um, you know, they start the young kids early and then they fall in love with, with camping and recreating. And the Idaho Fish and Game is so doing a good job of promoting hunting and fishing for the youth. So they have um, special tags for youth only, and that helps to um, introduce the uh, activity for the younger generation. Great, thank you. Okay, we do have a question from Jason. Don't get too quiet on us over there, Jason. Somebody has asked, what's the most unique use of land that you've seen recreational lately? or business-wise. So what's the most unique piece of land that you've seen recreationally or business-wise? So I guess really kind of focusing on the things as well. So. Oh, gosh. Um, I've seen uh, murder sites leased. 
uh, where blinds were built and photographers or birders would pay to go in these blinds or have exclusive rights to these blinds to, to look at birds during migration periods. Um, uh, seen a lot of activity related to honeybees and apiary leases lately uh, with honeybee declines. We're starting to see that across a lot of our client ownership. Uh, most of them are hobbyist type apiary uh, honeybee. Um, but th those are the two main ones that come to mind. Great. Brad, do you see, you know, you're talking about the blinds and people going out for bird watching. Do you guys have some of that similar activity on, on some of your conservation um, properties? Yeah, I think that's definitely an interest. Um, uh, some of the areas that we have under the state public wildlife access program draw birding enthusiasts and wildlife enthusiasts that are non-consumptive, you know, you know, compared to hunting. So, um, yeah, we, we do see that. You know, another thing, we've not figured this out yet, but another interesting idea, we have seen some interest in um, gathering of uh, traditional uh, plants um, and, and, you know, sort of a, that's a, that's a tradition, you know, harvesting uh, medicinal plants in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and it's something that has a long cultural history. Um, it's not something we currently allow, um, but it, we've had some interesting conversations about how we might try to accommodate something like that in a way that could be sustainable. But we haven't figured that out yet. But I just thought I'd mention that as another interesting idea. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much. We love it. Um, last question, and I'll let anybody have any um feedback here. What are some of the variables that you guys use for analyzing or, or for valuing recreation lands? So maybe we can start with Jason. Um, I'll just say that question again. What are some of the variables that you analyze for valuing recreational lands? Uh, variables. Uh, location, location, location is the, is the main one. Um, Proximity to urban areas, uh, uh, are they located near river systems? Do they have good access? Um, are they, uh, do they have food in stores nearby? I mean, or is it a 50 mile drive to, to Walmart or wherever they need to, a hunter may need to go? Um, and, you know, most hunters, just from a lot of the polls I've looked at, want a piece of property to recreate on within an hour to an hour and a half of their home. They don't want to drive to any more than two hours to go to recreate and you know you look at that where your property is located can determine a lot of the value that um, that it may offer to public that's nearby perfect okay guys i like people are sending more questions so we'll have just one more a couple more we have uh let's see we have one coming in that says are you seeing more recreational users incorporate digital technology as part of their outdoor activities? Drones, wildlife cameras and sensors, hunting apps, digital trail maps, and other apps? Does anyone have any insight on that? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Brad? We have noticed that there are... Um... There are trail apps um, that people use, and, and I'll say some are more accurate than others. And, and I'll be honest that sometimes they give us headaches um, because people think they're on trails that are open and they're not. Um, and I, we've actually talked about, you know, some, some, some need to probably do some outreach with some of these companies um, regarding accuracy. Um, so it's, you know, it's been a double-edged sword, I guess. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you so much for that feedback. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and, of course, for our panelists and your great responses and insight that you have provided today. Before we wrap everything up, I just want to provide uh, an opportunity, Brad, Brant, Jason, or anything else you wanted to add in regards to helping our end users and diversifying the recreational land use, anything you feel like you missed, you wanted to, to just add in now, I want to give you guys an opportunity. Brad looks good, Brad says it's good, Jason, you good? All right, well, 
thank you guys so much. I know everyone at home is clapping along with me. We really appreciate your time today, your insight and your knowledge sharing with our team. So I hope everyone uh, today has gotten some good takeaway from our panelists. Thank you again, Fran, Brad, and Jason for joining us. Um, I hope you guys have tuned in late or if you want to share anything you've heard today with your colleagues, we will be having this session up on Orbis's YouTube and LinkedIn pages for viewing and sharing uh, very soon. And like I said at the beginning, we are having a raffle after today's session. So if you guys were logged in, you're automatically entered into the drawing. We will contact the winner directly and we'll get uh, your prizes out to you shortly. Uh, so be out, look, be on the lookout for any sort of information uh, that's coming up on upcoming sessions. Thank you guys so much again for being here, and I hope to see you at our next campfire session. Have a great rest of your afternoon, and thanks so much for being here. Bye.